Hi, welcome to an enzyme kinetics tutorial. So, this diagram shows um, a box in the middle. This is supposed to represent an enzyme. It's a black box, we don't know what's going on, but it converts substrate at a concentration S into product, and it converts it at a reaction rate V. Now, what we're going to address in this tutorial is this question, how does the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction depend on the substrate concentration? So for example, if I were to double the substrate concentration, what would happen to the reaction rate? Would it also double? If I halved it, what would happen to the reaction rate? And so on. So that's the question we're going to address. Now we can, we can expand this black box into a mechanism, a proposed mechanism. Um, so in this, in this case, we have a free enzyme substrate, and these two bind together to form an enzyme substrate complex. And this complex can then release product and free enzyme. Sometimes the this reaction is fully reversible. So sometimes the enzyme substrate complex, instead of ending up as product, goes back again and releases substrate and enzyme. Okay, so this is a fairly dynamic process. It goes back and forth. Uh, and this one then converts. And it can also convert uh, itself into product and free enzyme. Now, this is a pictorial diagram. We, we can make this more concise. Uh, so it looks like this. This is the same thing. Uh, here I've got free enzyme, substrate, enzyme substrate complex and product. So we have enzyme plus substrate gives enzyme substrate products, product, which can break down to form enzyme and free product uh, and product. Free enzyme and product. Note this reaction is fully, freely reversible. These Ks, 1, 2, 3, are the first order kinetic rate constants. Um, so actually in most, most books you'll find these labeled K1, K-1, then K2. But I think it's easier to read if we just uh, label them 1, 2, 3. All right, so if you see in books this is K-1, don't be, don't be worried. I've just changed the notation slightly. Okay. Um, so what we're going to look at, in order to answer that initial question, you know, how how is the rate of reaction determined by the concentration of substrate, we're going to have to do some simplifications on this. I basically want an expression that tells me how fast product is made as a function of substrate. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to simplify or make some assumptions to try to simplify things. Um, there are two of the of such simplifications. Um, one called rapid equilibrium, which was first proposed in around about 1913, and the second one, a decade or so later, uh, called the steady state assumption. We'll look at both of these. Now, one assumption I'm going to make is that the reverse reaction from product to enzyme complex is negligible. So you notice here I had an arrow that only went in one direction. I'm going to assume that there's, pro there's no product, so that the reverse reaction pretty much doesn't exist. Now we can arrange this in a test tube experiment. Obviously in a cell that's not the case. In a cell there'll always be products so that may not be applicable when it comes to a cell. But that can be uh, adjusted uh, later on. But for now let's just assume that there's uh, no product so there's no appreciable reverse reaction back to the enzyme substrate complex. Okay so one last thing, uh, word of notation. Um, I'm going to use capital letters to indicate the name of a molecular spe species. So, for example, capital S means substrate, capital E means enzyme. On the other hand, for to represent concentration, I'm going to use small letters such as little s. So little s indicates the concentration of substrate. And I mean, there are four potential species, four species, E, S, E, S, and P, and they all have little letters. We won't use little P hardly at all, but we'll be using little E, little S, and little E, S a lot. And these represent concentrations of each of these respective species. Okay. All right, let's start with the rapid equilibrium assumption. So in the rapid equilibrium assumption, we assume that the binding of ES, E to S to form enzyme substrate complex and its breakdown is very fast. Much faster than, for example, the breakdown of enzyme substrate complex back to, uh, to product. So we're going to make the assumption that this is so fast, uh, the equilibration between the left and right side is so fast, that at any instant in time, we will assume that the binding and unbind reaction, this one, is at equilibrium. 
So in practice, what that means, if some ES disappears to form, breaks down to form product, it'll be immediately replaced by some more ENS, so that it's always in equilibrium, okay? Now, if it's always in equilibrium, we can write down the equilibrium relationship then. So I've pulled out that um, piece of the, of the mechanism. And if, it's, if it is that fast, we can say that any, any point in time, the ratio of E to the product of ENS is always equal to the dissociation equilibrium constant KD. Okay? So this basically is the rapid, this is the heart of the rapid equilibrium assumption, this relationship here. So this is just an equilibrium relationship. There's not, nothing uh, strange about that. Now, the other thing, actually going back here, nothing to remember as well is that this is a closed system. Um, actually, let me go back to the full one. Uh, this is a closed system. In other words, I'm not, there's no new E coming in and there's no E leaving. So the total amount of enzyme is actually fixed. And we can express that using this relationship here. So the total amount of enzyme in the system is the amount of free enzyme plus the amount of enzyme substrate complex. I can rearrange that just to have uh, to have free enzyme on the, on one side. So free enzyme is the total enzyme minus the enzyme substrate complex. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this term and substitute into into where E is in the equilibrium relation. So let me just show you again. So that's the the conservation term E equals E T minus E S, and that's the equilibrium term. I'm going to put this E, so this term here, into there, and I end up with that. All right, all I've done is taken that and put it into there and I get that. So we have KD equals ES divided by this product. Now all we need to do is to solve for ES. That means get ES on its own on one side of the equation. Um, all right, so that's not difficult to do. If I do that, I end up with this. All right, so I've, I've made sure that ES only appears on one side and all the other terms are on the left side. Now, the next thing I want to know is, um, well, what is the rate of reaction? Well, the rate of reaction is the rate of product formation. So maybe I had some way of measuring the product, so I could watch how, how the product increased. And that would be the rate at which the reaction is taking place. And that rate, of course, is this rate constant K3 times the concentration of enzyme substrate complex. And that's given by K3ES. So the rate of reaction is K3ES. Now what I'll do is I'll take this term, which is ES, and put it into uh, this ES here. Okay, so I'll take this term, okay, and put it into there. All right. So if I do that, I end up with this. Okay, that's all I've done. Now um, I'm going to take this pair of terms, K3ET, and I'm going to replace it with a symbol VM. We'll call this the maximal velocity. We'll see why later on. And this leads to this expression here. This is something you might be familiar with. Uh, this is the michaelis menten equation that was derived in 1913. Note the KD in the denominator. This is the dissociation constant. And this comes from the fact that we're assuming a rapid equilibrium between enzyme substrate complex and free enzyme. Okay, so now we can move on to the steady state assumption, and we'll come back to that later and, and go over what properties it has. But for now, let's look at the steady state assumption. Not everyone, so after that was derived, after the rapid equilibrium assumption expression was derived, not everyone um, was keen on it, and they, a lot of people thought it was a bit unrealistic that, you know, this this piece of the the reaction was always in equilibrium. So um, after some thinking, they decided that, well, um, we'll use something called, we'll invoke something, we'll invoke something called the steady state assumption. Now, if you were to do a simulation, let's say you took, took this, all right, built a computer simulation of it, which is what we've got here. This is a little tool you can get from this URL here. Uh, so this simulates that system. Uh, this is time along here. These concentrations along here. This one that's dropping here is the substrate concentration. This one that's climbing is the product. Uh, this one here, the flat one, which is the one we want to focus on, is the enzyme substrate complex. So if you were to run this, you start off with some substrate concentration and you run the simulation, you discover, surprisingly, that the amount of enzyme substrate complex is relatively constant. Uh, it's constant pretty much until we run out of substrate. 
So if you were in a test tube, you did this reaction in a test tube, you're probably studying it, you know, around about here, because uh, you don't wait that long. I mean, this could be minutes, for example, right? So you're in about 0.2 of a minute, and you notice that the amount of enzyme substrate complex is relatively constant. So if we do all our studies in this region, or actually in this whole region here, um, we can assume that the concentration of enzyme substrate complex is constant, all right? Now, there's a transient process here that happens. It looks like everything has happened instantaneously, but it's not quite. Um, if I were to zoom in at this point here, I would I would see I would see this. Okay, so I've just zoomed in on this very small piece here. Okay, I've zoomed in there, and I get this. Transient. So this is the initial transient that happens when I add substrate into a test tube of enzyme. And this line here is the enzyme substrate complex, and you can see it pretty much rapidly approaches steady state. Now, actually, if you do kinetic studies of rail enzymes, you'll find that this steady state is reached within milliseconds, like 5 to 10 milliseconds. So it's a very fast process. By the time you come to start measuring things, you're already at this steady state. Now, eventually, of course, everything runs runs down, and then the steady state is no longer, then the ES is no longer at steady state. But in that period, you are at steady state. So, why don't we look at uh, that and make that assumption? So, let's make that assumption, the steady state assumption, instead of the rapid equilibrium assumption. So, let's do that. Now, what does that mean? That means that the rate of change of ES is zero, okay? In other words, right, this line here, the rate of change of ES is zero, okay? Because this is horizontal, it's zero. Okay, so what we need to do then is derive what this is. And the way to do that is just to sum up all the things that produce ES and subtract all the things that consume ES. All right, so that'll give us the balance of how ES is changing. So the steps that there's only one step that produces ES, and that's the first, this one here that uh, related to K1, right? So that that reaction produces ES. There are two steps that consume ES because ES can go back to E plus S K2, but ES can also break down to form E and product. Uh, I put a negative sign on both of these to show that these are actually con consumption steps, and that's a, a production step. In order to get the rate of change of ES, I just need to add all these up, all right? So if I add all these up, I get this. That's all I've done is added them up, that, that, and that. So this, the rate of change of ES is due to ES being made, E minus ES being consumed, minus ES being consumed, right? And that's the rate of change of ES. So now all I have to do is set uh, DES to DT equals zero, that is invoke the steady state assumption. So I just put zero then. So in other words, I take this and I put a zero here. All right, so that's all I've done. I've taken that put a zero there. I note as before that the total amount of enzyme is free enzyme plus enzyme substrate complex or free enzyme is total minus enzyme substrate complex. And I'll put this into there, all right? So let's replace the E in the steady state equation with ETS. That means I end up with an equation that only has ES. There's only one, only one unknown, really, ES. I assume I know how much enzyme I added to the test tube. I assume I know how much substrate I've added to the test tube. And these are the kinetic constants, which are always con which are fixed. The only thing that's varying is ES. So let's uh, rearrange this equation and get ES on its own. So I've rearranged this equation. This is a good exercise for you. Just uh, move move terms around and you'll end up with something that looks like this. You see this complicated term here, K2 plus K3 divided by K1. And let's replace that with something called Km. Let's just replace it with a symbol and we'll call that symbol Km. So if I do that, all right, so I'm just gonna put that now where that is, okay. I end up with that enzyme substrate complex is that so that that complicated expression in terms of rate constants has now become km 
Again, let's remember what is the rate of reaction. The rate of reaction is the rate at which product has been formed, and that's simply K3 times the concentration of ES. I can now take this term and put it and replace it, replace this ES with it, and I end up with this. Okay. Now this piece here you might recognize from before. We replace that with the symbol Vm, which we call the maximum velocity. I'll do the same here. Okay, K3 ET equals Vm, and I end up with that. And this is probably something what you're mostly familiar with. Now, strictly speaking, this is uh, called the Briggs Holding equation after the two authors who derived this, who invoked the steady state assumption, although people often refer to this as the michaelis menten equation, but really it's the Briggs Holding equation. So if you ever see a Km in the denominator, you know it's the Briggs Holding equation. Now, how do we interpret this? I mean, in the rapid equilibrium assumption, it was easy. It was just the dissociation constant. Okay, but what is this Km? Well, let's look at that. So here's the rate law again, all right, which we just derived. Let's set V to half the maximum velocity, half Vm. So in other words, I'm going to, instead of V there, I'm going to put half Vm, all right? Note that the Vm's cancel. Okay, I'll bring this over to the other side, so I end up with that. I take the two over to this side, so I end up with the two there. And then I get km on its own, so I end up with 2s minus s, which gives s. So km equals s. So in other words, km is the substrate concentration at half the maximum velocity. Now it's easy to see that in a figure. So this is the graph where I've plotted v, the rate of reaction, versus s, the substrate concentration. And it looks something like this. This is actually a hyperbola starts off linearly and starts curving off and eventually if I went on and on and on it would eventually reach uh, Vm. Vm in this case is 1.0. So if I take half the Vm, right, remember I said back here I'm going to set V to half the Vm. So if I take half the Vm, which is down here which is 0.5, so that's 0.5, take the line across then drop the perpendicular this, that's the point, that's the Km. So the Km is the concentration of substrate at half the maximum velocity. Okay, so finally, just a summary, uh, we've got two derivations. Uh, you end up with two equations that look identical, except for the interpretation of the symbols. The briggs holden equation, which assumes steady state, has the Km in the denominator, and we've seen what that Km means. It's the substrate concentration at half the maximum velocity. And then the michaelis menten equation that was derived uh, earlier has a Kt, Kd in the denominator, and that represents the dissociation constant. Okay, so uh, next time we'll look at what happens when we relax the restriction uh, that product is a, is negligible. So, because in rail cells, of course, there is product, and we'll product will get converted back to substrate. Okay. Until next time. Thank you.